Hello, everybody. Thanks and welcome to this episode of our podcast. Uh, today's uh, topic is going to be about oral bisphosphonates or in general bisphosphonate drugs. Um, it's kind of an interesting topic, a hot topic in dentistry. And today's guest is none other than Dr. Andonis Terezides. He is an oral maxillofacial surgeon. Um, and I'm going to brag on you a little bit. Uh, you are an oral surgeon. You started school. Uh, your track to become an oral surgeon, just because I've known you for so many years, was extensive. I don't think I know anybody who has more desire and push to become an oral surgeon. You started off in Baltimore and you started off, at, I think, in Indiana. Then you had to leave for some medical uh, family issues. You left. You came back here to Orlando, started practicing as a general dentist, and clearly being an oral surgeon was in your blood because you just couldn't do it. You went back. You had to do a year in Miami, basically as like a slave. They call that an internship year. Didn't even count towards your oral surgery. Then four years of oral surgery in, I understand, the toughest or one of the most rigorous oral surgery programs in the world. Um, so I don't think anybody uh, that I know spent 10 years becoming an oral surgeon, whatever it was. So bravo for you and um, your training is extensive. So one more add to that is the reason that I wanted you for this topic and no other is, as you know, and nobody else watching this may know, but the director of your program in Miami is Dr. Marks. He is pretty much the guy who invented or discovered everything there is to know about bisphosphonate drugs and how they affect dentistry. So you trained under him. So other than having him on here, I can't imagine you're pretty much going to be a shadow on here. I know you know the stuff like backwards and forwards. So let's get right into it. Sure. What are bisphosphonate drugs? Um, uh, what, what is it I'm talking about? What do people need to know that are watching this or, 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 or learning about this? Well, bisphosphonates is a class of medications that are, are used for multiple medical indications. There's an oral form, which is commonly used for something like osteoporosis. Uh, and then there are IV and injection forms, which are commonly used for things like metastatic cancer uh, or treating certain uh, electrolyte and metabolic disturbances that are related to cancer uh, treatment, something called hypercalcemia of malignancy. Uh, they've come into play, the, the medications, because more and more people are on them over the years, over the last close to 20 years that bisphosphonates have come into the market. And uh, with them over time, not seen necessarily in the initial studies, we've started to see problems. And as you alluded to, Dr. Marks down in Miami in 2003 wrote some of the uh, initial publications, actually the first uh, documented cases of bisphosphonate-induced osteonecrosis of the jaws. Okay, what is that? What is osteonecrosis? I mean, I, 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 what sure. is that in, in layman's terms? Sure. Well, that means jaw bone death. In other words, dead jaw bone. Okay. Really I, I see, I see bone that. That doesn't heal and it just dies after okay. some sort of trauma or insult or injury, which could be something as simple as certain dental procedures or spontaneous. Sure. And I, I mean, the, where I've seen that the most is I see these lawyer ads, you know, uh, during, the t during the day, you know, do you have, have you been taking these bisphosphonates, uh, the big one being Fosamax, and they mm -hmm. say, you know, call our law line, and, you know, they're obviously having big lawsuits over it. So let me, people, who, what's the segment of the population, male, female, what age category, who are mostly taking these medications? I mean, you said, you said the, the different uh, cancers, but who are the bulk of people taking these medications, and what are the major labeled names of these medications that well, people should be know of? Sure. Well, the bulk of medications being taken are uh, usually postmenopausal uh, females okay. who uh, are suffering from uh, osteoporosis. There are also a subset of patients who are have what they call pre-osteoporosis or osteopenia who are also being treated by uh, using these medications. Uh, that's that's the biggest subset, and those are the oral form pills, which uh, come in a medicine called Fosamax, which you said, which is also called Aledronate, the generic form. Mm -hmm. And more commonly now, we're starting to see more patients on a medication called Boniva, which is a bandronate. Uh, okay. That's a, that's one that's on a lot of the commercials now during uh, the evening news. Uh, there's one form of intravenous uh, bisphosphonate, also for osteoporosis, called Reclast, and okay. that's zolindronic acid. That's a very, very powerful medication. So that's the one category, and it's mostly postmenopausal females. So middle-aged women. So, so people watching this that are, are learning about this or know somebody, 
uh, middle-aged women are the best, you know, what you see day in and day out, women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever the case may be, those are the major labeled drugs. Okay, so what what do you do? What You're, you're obviously treating these patients. Uh, you don't want to have this jaw death, clearly. What do people need to know? And if they're coming to see you, you already know it all, so that's not a big deal. But if, right. what do people need to know about it so that they're informed going to their dentist, going to their oral surgeon, or what to look out for? Well, I would say that probably the most important thing is to know your present medications that you're on and know the history of medications that you've been on in the past. It's really, really a pleasant experience for us when a patient comes prepared uh, mm -hmm. for a consultation with a list of medications and knows their medical history or at least has contacts to their physicians that we may be able to contact and speak to. When we look at uh, a patient's medical history, we look at the conditions that they may check off on that little checkbox list. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that keys us into some problems that they may be on, and sometimes they don't check off that they have something because they think they're treated for it because they're taking a medication. In other uh, words, yes. I don't have high blood pressure yes, because yes. I take blood pressure medicine. Right, right, right. right. Still yeah. have it. And the same thing with this medicine. And when we see any any sort of history that may lead us off into the direction that the patient may have been exposed to this phosphate, it's either for the osteoporosis reasons or for, uh, say, a metastatic cancer, uh, or if they've checked off some other certain very powerful medications like long-term steroids, methotrexate or chemotherapy, then as oral surgeons, we kind of automatically go down the path just to rule out this history of having been on bisphosphonates at some point, whether now, presently, or in the past. And, and then from there, we really want to find out how long they've been on it because there's a correlation to how much medication you've been on uh, for how long to what your risks are to developing certain complications from Okay, so I'm a patient coming to you. I'm a 60-year-old postmenopausal woman. I've been on this medication for two years, let's say. Let's say two or four. Let's just give those two examples. How do you, okay. what do you do? Let's just say it's the pill form because that's the most common sure. one. What are you doing? How are you treating me differently? I need a tooth taken out, obviously, and that's kind of where this whole thing starts is okay. for some sort of surgery a lot of times. How do you manage that? Well, if you've been on it for two years, I'll inquire if you've been on any other brands or formulations of the medicine in the past. And at the two-year mark, we've seen in the research that two years of that medication without certain other medical conditions or comorbidities, we're okay to proceed with surgery as we normally would. But if you've been on that medication for two years and you've also been on steroids or methotrexate or had chemotherapy for an unrelated condition, then we start to worry that you might show signs of poor wound healing. And so what we want to do is take a step back if possible, if we have the luxury of it not being an emergent treatment, uh, to gather a little bit more information, and that usually comes in the form of doing a lab test. Um, and, and in our practice, that laboratory test is called a CTX, which is a C-terminal telepeptide. And what we do is we give you a prescription or we have you take that same prescription to your physician, depending on your insurance, and have them recopy what we write for you. And we send you to a lab like Quest Lab or Core Lab, mm -hmm. and you give one or two small little vials of blood in the morning of fasting, basically, around between 8 and 10 in the morning. You give a fasting blood, blood draw, and they send that lab test off to a lab, usually in Tampa or California, and it comes back with a value. And based on that value, if you're above a certain number, we can kind of correlate a risk whether or not we should proceed with surgery or if we should delay surgery. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't have that luxury as, as surgeons because we have patients who are in pain, they have infections, they have things that sometimes need to be treated. Mm -hmm. And other times we can see that you know we really do need to wait because the risks and the complications that might come from having an extraction can pr be pretty serious. Okay. And so then we go down the route of maybe talking to a root canal doctor or somebody to try to at least temporarily hold the tooth off while we can uh, talk with the patient's physician about maybe stopping the medications or putting them on a, what we call a drug holiday. What what is that? So you said you can if you have some luxury of time. So uh, the the test let's just say the test comes back it's too high it's too risky. What's a drug holiday? Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. All right. Well, usually the test would come back as too low. We look for a number called uh, 150 picograms per milliliter or or higher to be safe. So if it's below 150, we like to have what we call a drug holiday where we'll coordinate with your physician and ask your physician to, to have you stop taking that medication for a period of time, usually on the range of six to nine months. Mm -hmm. Because what this will allow, will allow the body to start to heal uh, and, and grow some of these um, cells that are used in, in bone healing 
to allow them to repopulate where they've been where they've been depleted because of the medications. Okay. And in doing so, you have a better chance of healing following a procedure. Okay, and then so the, the, in essence, you take the patient off the drug. Again, I, I know it's important to make sure that and you don't. You check with their right. physician, the make sure. The right, right, right. And then they come off it for six months. I take it you retake that same CTX test. Now it's uh, over 150, it's 300, and now that's low risk, and now you can proceed with the extraction. That's the ideal way. You can proceed with confidence, usually knowing that, and I can tell you from my training down at the University of Miami, I never saw a patient develop an osteonecrosis of the jaws or dead jawbone if their CTX values were 150 or higher at the time of their mm -hmm. extraction. So mm -hmm. that's really positive news, and that really comes back to a lot of the work of Dr. Marks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I said at the beginning, you know, Dr. Marks invented all this stuff. I mean, it's all, it's, I think it's called Marks Protocol. I mean, it's, uh, it's all over the place. So clearly, I know you know this stuff inside and out, and I appreciate you trying to, you know, simplify it for somebody like me to understand it. But um, so some of the take-home messages I'm getting is the, these medications are called bisphosphonates. You have Fosamax, Boniva, Reclast. Um, obviously very important for patients watching this or if you know somebody who is having oral surgery who's in this age, um, um, make sure you know what medications you're on, tell the surgeon who's doing the surgery what you're on. Uh, from there you can manage what's the best way to take them off the drug, do a test to see if they're safe. So one other question, what are the major procedures you have to be careful? Like what if you're having dental implants? Um, done. Uh, can you do dental implants? I mean, is it anything that basically involves bleeding? I mean, I, I, you know, can you do like cleanings if you're on this medication? You know, what are the things that patients should say, okay, I have to make sure somebody knows what's going on here? Sure. What we will usually tell patients and we'll tell the referring dentist to us is that patients can have routine general dental work. This means fillings, routine cleanings, uh, crown and bridge work, restorative treatments that you would uh, have made, dentures uh, to be done as well. Again, fillings, all the sort of cosmetic work okay. that you would do. We like sometimes for people to hold off on, on special deep cleanings that involve surgical manipulation like surgical periodontal okay. cleanings uh -huh. or, uh -huh. um, as well as dental implants and bone grafting. Those are the ones that can get patients into trouble, okay. surgical procedures. Okay. Surgical Things involving the bone, the jaw, obviously it's called jaw death. Well. Listen, I really appreciate it. Um, I think I hope anybody here watching this enjoyed it, learned something. I know I did. Uh, please add some comments to the YouTube video. If you have any questions, me, myself, or you, Dr. And, uh, Dr. Terazidis, can try to answer them. Uh, I really appreciate your time, and I'm um, looking forward to our next one, next uh, podcast episode. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Sure.